We will have a microphone that will come around to you. If you want to ask a question, please put your hand up. Wait till the microphone comes so that everybody can hear a question. I think that's all we need to say at this stage, so let's see how we go. Are there any questions? One over here. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, you said before about uh, Judas being dressed as Jesus to be crucified. Um, how is he passed over to the, uh, the soldiers um, in the Quran? Uh, in, in the Bible, Judas is there as Jesus is being handed over. So I wonder if Judas is made to look like Jesus, how is, how is the handover done in the Quran? Thank you. I think I understand the question. Um, well, I wasn't quite sure the word Judas because in the Arabic is Yahuda, name Yahuda. Basically, he was uh, what you call in Arabic, in Islam, Munafiq. Munafiq is the one who pretend to be the follower, pretend to be the follower of Jesus, to be his disciple. So he betrayed Jesus. And because of that, maybe God punished him. Uh, maybe God punished him. And... And so, in the commotion, because the Roman soldier don't know which is, which is Jesus, which is whoever. So God can make you. If he ma wants to make you look like Michael Jackson, there's no problem for God. Okay? If he wants to make you like me, no problem. He can do it. He can do it. So, I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, so I cannot answer you this question. Old enough? Yes, yeah, well, could be. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so I cannot really answer. All I know is from the Quran and from the saying of Prophet Muhammad, the Quran did actually say, I replaced him, but you people know not. So what happened is, Allah says in the Quran, Wa minan nasi man wa marid. All of us don't know much about Allah. We know very little. We know very little about him. Yet you want to differ with him with no knowledge. I haven't got the knowledge. Okay? So I cannot answer you properly whether he was Judas, whether Yahuda, whatever. I only just mentioned him because I wasn't sure. But I know in my book it's called Yahuda. According to some learned people, right? And he was made to look like him. That's no problem. We can make people look at that. When you look at the, what's it, deal or no deal? All the, how many? 26 girls, they all look alike to me. Huh? So if I were the Roman soldier, I could just grab any one of them to be Jesus. Or to be Yahuda. Or to be Jesus, I mean. Okay? I hope I answered your question. You mentioned about the Musa, alayhi salam, Moses, a son of the God, if I'm not wrong. And so, sorry, I, I mentioned Moses? Moses, the son of God. Moses, son of Moses, God? Yeah. No, I didn't okay. say Moses right. was the son okay. of God. Okay, so you not agree with that? Um, oh, sorry, yes, okay. I said that the nation of Israel... Yes. In the law of Moses is called the son of God. That's it. So the title son of God is used through, through the prophet. You, yes. Are you agree with that, please? Are you agree with that, what, what they say? Yes. Yes, okay, that's fine. And which means, if God had a wife 1,400 years ago, and his son was named Moses. And then after that, he had son, another son called Isa, Alisam, or Jesus. Which means, God has a wife. Uh, so, the, the yeah, yeah. question, God had a wife? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's not what we're saying as Christians. We're not saying that the nation of Israel was actually born from God. Right? So, w when the prophets use the phrase son of God, they're not actually saying that, well, in the case of Moses, that he actually was born from God in a miraculous way, or, but it is a title of a relationship that you have with God. It's referring to a spiritual relationship you have where God is your father and you are his son and his heir. And so we see that title being used of the nation of Israel, of the Messiah, of Solomon in the book of Chronicles, and of Christians. And the Christian, yes. So, I mean, God had a wife. That's my question. God had a wife. That's correct? Sorry, does God have a wife? Yes. Uh, no. No. That's not what we're, that's not what we're saying. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, can I... Uh, the, the other speaker, Mr. Green, gave examples 
um, in history of texts and other evidence for Jesus outside the Bible and the Quran. Um, but the only evidence I see that you gave was from in the Quran. Can you also substantiate from historical documents um, what you were saying from outside the Quran, other than the Quran? No problem. Because of my limited time, I did have evidence from the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from all the companions, even though they lived some 600 years after the ascension of Jesus to paradise. So the evidence, because we, we Muslims, that's one thing about Muslims, the Quran is our constitution. If you can just think of the constitution of Australia, we kept to it. Right, America have their constitution, we kept to that. And so, for Muslims, no matter where they go, they have the Quran as their constitution. Regardless whether the ruler is Lennon or David Patrick now, or we'll have John Howard later come back, we don't worry about it. It will be our constitution. So, for us, that's good enough. And we do not refer to the old books and, uh, or other testament of men because men are very good at making up stories. If you go fishing, for example, you know, you catch a fish that long. By the time you see your brother and sisters and the fish already gone and you ate it, probably become that big. Okay, so we do not go to all other evidences. But the Quran is good enough for me because we believe that it's the word of God. Whenever we say... We read the Quran, we finish with Sadaqallah Nazim, and many Muslims will know this is the truth from Allah. Very simple. So, that's my answer. But there are evidences from, if you wish, I can bring it on my computer to you. And there are evidences from Prophet Muhammad saying, and from other evidences. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, I want to ask you, uh, since Jesus is the Son of God, so... I believe that Christian believe that Jesus is the God, is it? Sorry, what was that? You... Uh, I believe that Christian believe that Jesus is a God, is it? Because you guys believe in Trinity concept? Yes. Yep. The God. And my question is, why you, why Christian worshipping Jesus instead of the God? And uh, I read from the Bible, the St. Matthew um, verses uh, 46, when... Uh, Jesus uh, wanted to be crucified at the cross and he, he said uh, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying Eli Eli lama sabachthani that is to say my God my God why has you forsaken me and my question is why if Jesus is believed that he will be crucified to save all the mankind's sin why he he cried when he wanted to be killed. Why, why he cried? Why he cried for help from the God? Why, why he do that? Okay. All right, well, there's, there's two questions there. Um, the first one has got to do with the Trinity and how uh, are we worshipping God when we, we see Jesus as God? That's the first part there. Um, it's absolutely correct that Christians and Muslims have a completely different understanding about God. Christians believe in what is called the Trinity and that is uh, what we see revealed to us. And so Jesus is described in the New Testament in monotheistic terms and at the same time revealing a relationship within God. So Jesus is called the Word of God. And so th that is a monotheistic description because there is the God who speaks his Word but yet we still see this relationship being revealed between God and his Word. Jesus in Hebrews 1 is spoken of as uh, the, the radiant glory of God. Now, it's a monotheistic statement which reveals a relationship within God. Now, this is actually quite logical. You, you, you can't get to it through logic, but when it's revealed, what it means is that God is more complex than us. God is relational. That is, he's not a force, he's a person, he's relational. And God is self-sufficient. And you see, if God truly is self-sufficient then his relational aspects must be met within himself. Otherwise, he's dependent upon creation for any expression of his being. And you actually find this being discussed in Sufi terms and, and, and other Islamic terms where, where they wrestle with this, where Allah is on his own and how can he 
relate to anyone, and, and it's also the basis of pantheism. So we have a very different understanding when it comes to the Trinity, but I want to argue the Trinity is reasonable because it, it shows that the self-sufficient God truly is self-sufficient and didn't create in order to have any relationship because he's related within himself. And that's one. The second one, why did Jesus call out... Uh, if he was saving people, why was he sort of you know, crying out for help in the act of saving? Well, that's because... and I'm going to say what it is, though I don't understand what it is, why this is the case. But God calls upon his people to suffer before entering their glory. So Joseph, if you remember the story of Joseph in the Bible and the Quran, he is falsely accused, he suffers in prison, but then he enters his glory at Pharaoh's right hand. King David uh, is, suffers by Saul and, and has the opportunity to kill Saul, but doesn't. He suffers with his friends being killed, and, but then after Saul dies, he enters into his glory. The prophet Daniel, he's promised to sit at the king Xerxes' right hand, or Darius's right hand, but before he does that, he has to suffer before entering his glory. And Jesus, he's called upon to suffer before entering his glory. Why is that the case? It's the will of God. God has just done that for his servants. And, and in fact, that's the path that all Christians have to, to walk as well, that we suffer before entering our glory. And that suffering hurts, and that's why Jesus called it out. Good evening. Uh, the ministry of Jesus lasted about 33 years. Uh, this is even admitted by Yusuf Ali in his comment number 388 on Surah 346. But Surah 5, 110 says he taught the people in and up to his old age. Would you consider 33 being of old age? Is that stretching the imagination too far? So I can just repeat that. Is yep, certainly. To Jesus. Okay. Um, Jesus ministered to 33 years of age. In um, comment 388 by Yusuf Ali on Surah, 346. He even admits that it was only up to the age of 33. But Surah 5, 110, says he taught people up to his old age. Thank you. Okay. So. I think I understand the question. Uh, this is where I talked earlier about Jesus is going to come back. This is the end of time, and Al Masih, it's called Al Masih, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, will come back to save this world because. This is one of the signs of the end of time. The end of the time is when Al-Mahdi will come back and he will rule this world together with Jesus. In fact, he's going to come down in Damascus. He's going to come down in Damascus, Jesus, and he will look, his skin will be almost white and red. And it appears that his face has got water coming dripping and he got this yellow robe that he wear. And then a prayer was offered to be offered by Imam Mahdi in this mosque, but the Azan, the call of prayer, was already offered. So Jesus said to Mahdi, This prayer is for you to be the Imam. So Jesus came down to extend the religion of Islam. The extended religion of Islam. And he lived for 40 years, to, according to one hadith. And that's why he lived to an old age. When he ruled this world, there'll be peace. There'll be here. The whole world will be peace. Uh, there won't be no killing. Uh, animals, kids will be playing with snakes and the snake won't bite you. The uh, lions will be playing with camels and cows and they'll be friends. And you won't have any problem with your neighbors throwing rubbish into your fence. All right? And money will be in abundance that people who pay zakat, nobody wanted it. Will pay, um, we call zakat or charity, nobody wanted it because there's so much money in that time. So this is during the time of Jesus. So he will write to an old age about 40. So from my understanding, he could have lived together 33 in the past and then another 40 years later. That is the knowledge belong to God. And I don't think I like to live in that time. I'm old anyway. So because in that time, things would have changed very much. I hope I've answered your question. You mentioned something about the name of Isa when we says. Prophet Isa and Jesus is not the same one we talk in Islam. You talk about different one, and even Maryam. Yes. You say Maryam is different one. Yes. All right. Assume you as a position, you you did had chance to read the Quran. So, are you agree when we because there's a lot of prophets mentioned in the Quran, 
Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ishaq, Jacob, Ya'qub. Are you agree with this or name? Correct or not? So are we Sorry, ag- can, can you speak a bit closer yeah. to the microphone? Are we, because this mention a lot of prophets in the yes. Quran. Yep. Like Abraham, which I think is the same. You agree with that? The same name? Yes. Okay. David, Dawood, yep. and Noah. Noah, yep. So they all same like to mention in Quran and yes. same you agree with this name. Yes. So you only ag- disagree with the two names which is Maryam and Isa. Jesus. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with no, Miriam. No, no, they, they different persons. Yes. You're talking about Isa as a different person and you, a Christian talks about that Jesus as a different person, not like we say. No, I'm saying that the name Isa is not the Arabic way of saying Jesus. Yes, it's, so it's a different one. Yeah, it's Yeshua. Yeshua. So, oh, but Yeshu. when when we talk about the Isa alayhi salam, so we're not talking about the Joshua or not? No, I think we are talking. Uh, we're certainly referring to the same person, but I'm saying that the it's not the accurate name that's being used. So it's an apocryphal the, name from later centuries. But we talk about the same person. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not disagreeing there. But what I'm saying is. In terms of history, it doesn't, it's not connecting in with, with the name of Jesus from that time in Arabic. It's, it's, it's a much later development of that name, and so it's not an eyewitness account, not a historical account in that sense, but, but, but reflects the culture that it was in. Oh. As I said, it's not a major point, but as the Quran is claiming to restore the truth about Jesus, then I feel it should at least get his name correct but in Arabic, because it does get the other names correct. Yeah, but that's what I said. Maybe we are translated, in the, or in English, when you translate in the different... To the English, when you translate from Arabic to the English, it's come different way. So uh, Christian says "Son of God," we says "Prophet of the God." So that was okay. Right. <laughs> um, I'm asking if you guys do Christians believe that um, Jesus has a biological connection with God, which is his father, according to the Christians. So, is there any biological connection between the two? We are saying that Jesus is of the same substance as God and that he comes from God, not by way of creation, but, but as the word comes from God or as the glory comes from God. So we don't see him in that creation category. We see him coming from God as the word comes, the God who speaks, his word is, uh, is native to him, it's natural to him. So we see Jesus as the word of God, we see Jesus as the glory of God. And so that's how we understand his connection and his relationship to God. Yeah, so it's not biological? It, it's not biological in the sense of that, that God had sex with Mary, no. It's not like that, but it's of the same substance. Um, and he comes from God by, by way of the word. As the word comes from God, that's how Jesus comes from God. As the glory comes from God, that's how Jesus comes from God. Okay, and um, you also mentioned everyone is the son of God. And, does that, are you, and is that the same... Um, principle? No, th- th- that's not. And so within the, within the Bible, the, the phrase son of God can be used slightly differently for, for different times. And so God will often speak about adopting someone in to be his son. And so the way that Christians talk about becoming sons is through adoption. We speak about it as adoption. So uh, we, we are united to Jesus and adopted as, as sons in that sense. But there's a big difference between our sonship and his but yet we still, have, we still carry that title. Okay, and um, can I have a quick last question as well? Yep. Um, so when Jesus was being killed, according to the Christians, did God allow this to happen or did he want this to happen or couldn't he prevent this from happening? Yeah, well, the Bible says that it was certain, like I think Acts chapter 2 is a good verse there where it says, I'll, I'll just get it. The reason why things happen in the world is an interesting question on its own. It says, men, uh, so Acts chapter 2 verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through, through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's, God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So we see there that the Jewish people at that time were actually held accountable for crucifying Jesus. They and the Romans did it. 
So they were responsible in, 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 their, in their sinfulness against God in doing it. But it was also God's plans in the prophets. And so the Bible maintains that God is sovereign over all events. And at the same time, humans are still genuinely responsible for what we do. And the both are true. That so God is did, sovereign and we are responsible. So did God want... Um, Sorry, we, um, this is becoming a, quite a monologue yep. now. I've been very lenient, I think. If you want to take that up again with Sam, take it up again later. Is there anyone over here who wanted to ask any questions? We've had no one from... The, uh, the other speaker uh, cited uh, a number of uh, witnesses uh, to the, the Christian account of Jesus. Um, is it true then, according to your uh, uh, submission, that there is just this single witness uh, through uh, the Prophet Muhammad for uh, the... Jesus account. Is that a question to Sabri or Sam? Uh, to Sabri, uh, according to the law of Moses, uh, it's a well-established uh, principle that uh, there needs to be at least two eyewitnesses. And I'm just curious as to um, your understanding that the uh, Muslim uh, wit account is based off just a single witness? Thank you very much. I think I understand the question that for any events to occur, there should be two witnesses. There are a couple of things. One is, if you, say, for example, make an agreement, uh, say selling a car or something, uh, or selling your house, and you don't want to go to solicitor to save a lot of money, among the Muslim all you need is two men to witness the transaction. So you write it down, and the two men witnesses agree to it and sign it, and it will be finished, halas. So that is. But another one, since about witness, there's another one that's regarding uh, fornication. Right? In that case, God has made it quite almost impossible for a man or woman to be stoned to death as in the Old Testament. Right? So in the Quran, the Hadud law makes it even harder for Muslims so if you see a Muslim man and Muslim woman come out of a room and suddenly you, you, you saw them, ah, they must be doing something wrong. So you accuse them of fornication. You must have four eyewitnesses and got to be four men. Four eyeballs looking at it, at the egg. So I think that's what your question is. So the two witnesses is for any transaction? Yes, correct. Got to be two witnesses. But this other one is an exception. Got to be four eyewitnesses. But my understanding, sir, is that... Um Muhammad was the only uh, witness in his uh, testimony regarding Jesus in the Quran. Muhammad is the only witness for? I didn't get that. Muhammad is the only witness. No, he is didn't. That is that a question or a statement? I'm just asking, is, is that my understanding um, in your submission that the Prophet Muhammad is the only eyewitness or the only witness of uh, the count of Jesus in the Quran? To what, what event? What, what was happening when he was a witness? To what event that you're asking? The life of Jesus, as opposed to the previous speaker who's... Or to the life of Jesus. He was not witness because he came 600 years after Jesus. <laughs> See, if you recall, the prophet, you know, they come, there are 25 great uh, messengers of God. Jesus came in the Julian calendar around two, year 2000, uh, 2,000 years ago, all right, 1 AD, if you look at that. And then Prophet Muhammad came 600 and something odd years later. So he could not be a witness. He didn't live that long. He only lived for 63 years. So he couldn't be a witness. All right? So the one I'm talking about is about, to say, like the crucifixion. This only hadith, a saying of Prophet Muhammad. He wasn't a witness you know, in the Quran then because... In this hadith, he was relating the story of the crucifixion. So God has given him knowledge about this thing because he was chosen. He was chosen by God to, to be the last messengers, to be, the, to, the, to be for all nations. See, after Muhammad, there's no more messengers. There's no more messengers. So he was given this knowledge about a lot of things well before time, even how Adam was created, how Moses was removed from the promised land and so on 
and how Joseph was put in the well and things like that. We got, we got hadith of that related by Prophet Muhammad. But he wasn't a witness. Okay, thank you. I think I've answered your question. Maybe I can try to clarify what I think the question that was being answered. Remember how you spoke of uh, big fish, big fishing story. Fisherman comes home and says the fish was oh, yes, yes, yes. long. Um, my understanding with the Bible is that there are several men that attest to a big fish. So there's, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke. Here's a big fish, Jesus. I think maybe where the questioner was coming from was with Muhammad... There's one, one man attesting to a big fish, but is he the only witness to receiving that information from Gabriel? Is he the only man who is witness to that question is, reception your question of information? Is, your, question your question is... Is he the only man um, witness to that reception of information from Gabriel? Yes. Okay. He is the only one who received... Archangel Gabriel, just to, since you asked the question, uh, God spoke to all the prophets... To all the prophets, but with an exception, to Prophet Musa alayhi salam on the Waturi Sin, eh? the, the man of Sinai. Can somebody of the Arabic people, I think it's man of Sinai. He, God spoke himself, and that's the only time God spoke. And he was, of course, he was witnessed by his wife, of course, he tells his wife, stay behind, I'll go and see what's happened to that fire. And he was given the Ten Commandments. So in this case, Moses was the witness to God's voice when he got the Ten Commandments. Any other thing, Archangel Gabriel were the one who talked to all the messengers of God. All of them. All of them. There are 25 great prophets to Muhammad, except in one instance when we were ordered to pray. Last couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the ascension of Muhammad, peace be upon him, to heaven. Right? That's the only instant when Muhammad spoke to God. And even that, we don't know where they actually saw him because he didn't say that. He saw God. He saw his face. He didn't. In fact, Archangel Gabriel, when he got to the seventh heaven, I said, I'll stop here. I cannot go in there or my, my, my wings will be burned. So Prophet Muhammad went alone and he spoke to God. And then he went further to Yon to see uh, hell and heaven. And then he came back and we were ordered to pray five times a day. This prayer ordered was... Prayer, the ordering of prayer and paying of zakat, a paying of charity, was ordered to all the nations before us, to Moses, to Jesus, to Abraham. We all have to pay, uh, have to pray. So each time this incident happened within Gabriel and the messenger of God, yes, there's no witnesses. It's only between the two. Thank you. Well, I suppose my question could be asked of either speaker, but I intended it for the imam, if that's okay. Um, I'm, as always, very taken by the similarities between Christianity and Islam, and indeed uh, with Judaism as well. And every time I speak with followers of Is Islam, I learn something new about those similarities. And tonight it was the reference to uh, the return of Jesus in the future when he will come again and the things that are associated with that. And my greatest desire is to spend eternity with my maker, my creator, my father, with God. And my question is how I might achieve that. Very good question. Listen good then. Um, first of all, I put you a surah. First one is called al i I'll read it to you again. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kul huallahu ahad. Allahu samad. لم يرد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفا أحد صدق الله العظيم. In the name of Allah, most beautiful, compassionate. Say, in fact, actually say, O Muhammad, there's only one God. He is eternal, absolute. He got no beginning, no end. There's no one to start him. He's neither born nor give birth. And then the last sentence is. There's none like him. So he doesn't like Jesus, he doesn't like Moses, he doesn't like anybody. That's one. Secondly, in your commandment, worship nothing but Allah. Worship nothing but God. So God is one. So if you worship one God, you believe in God, you submit yourself to Islam, which is the religion of all the one before us, including the one that brought by Jesus, peace be upon him, by Moses, by Abraham, by Noah and by Adam. 
So if you believe in that and you do charity, you submit yourself to the will of God, inshallah, by the will of God, you will go to eternity. Uh, you will abide there forever in, he- in heaven. So this is, and for that, you've got to submit yourself to God. And that is a very good, uh, uh, a big ask from you. From me to you, that's a big ask. So you've got to look at it, what I ask of you to do. But I have no power over you. Thank you. I think that was a very general question that clearly ought to be directed to both speakers. So I'll get Sam to comment on the same question and then we will call it to Thank you for that question. It is the most important one. In Christianity, we see that the way that uh, you will be a member of God's kingdom forever is through responding to what God has done for you. So the story in the Bible is that God has given us laws, has given us guidance, but that we cannot attain the standard that God requires. That, in fact, sin has touched us to the very heart of our being and that we need God to do something for us. Now, what God has done for us is what I tried to outline in my overview of the prophets, that from Abraham through to Jesus, it was the coming of Jesus and and God giving of his son as the payment for our sin, which is the way in which we are washed clean, cleaner than we could wash ourselves. And, and, And that's the Christian understanding that Jesus' death on the cross can qualify us to be members of God's kingdom forever. And so it's all based on what God has done for us in Christianity and responding to that. We'll there. Thank you, Sam. I think we'll call it quits there. Uh,